Okay, welcome back after the break. Uh, so there was a question uh, posted by Saubhagya Lakshmi. She says that one of the brother whom she knows, he wanted to do God's work. He did, he studied in a Bible college. After finishing, he joined the church, but they kept him from uh, they kept him to do office work, but they did not involve him in any ministry. So he was disappointed. And in that case, what that brother should do, whether he should leave the church, or is it God's will for that person to stay there in the church? What do you all think? If there's no peace, then it's not God's will. OK, anyone else? Applying the principles what we learned, what should this brother do? He studied in a Bible college. He's gone back to his church. They're just asking him to do office work, no ministry-related work. He's very disappointed. What should he do? Come on, from what we studied so far. He should ask God, right? He should ask God when he was in Bible college itself, what is God's will for his life? Should he go back to his church? He should go back to some other church. What is God's calling? Where is God calling him to go? Okay. So if he senses that it's God's calling to go back to his church, then he goes back to his church. And if they're giving him only office-related work, then, you know, maybe there's a time when God is training him in some office-related things. You should just be patient there, and then God will launch him out. So I'll just give you my example. When I was in Bible college, um, I... Um, I was praying what God wanted me to do, and um, I um, I had got a partial funding from uh, one organization, and when they said they'll fund my uh, studies, they said they'll pay half the fees. But when I joined Bible College, sorry, they said they'll pay my full fees for the, the all the years that I'm studying. But when I joined Bible College, the first, I think the second week, they sent a letter saying that there will only partially fund me and then as long as they sponsor me I have to work for them see and I felt that was not right because before I came to Bible College I was with them in for ministry for two months and um, they didn't tell me all this but after I came to Bible College putting all these clause I thought was not right and I, I didn't know that I am, you know, the Holy Spirit is speaking and leading and how to depend and how to hear the Holy Spirit. But I just sensed something in my heart and I knew that this is not right. And I was very bold. I told them I don't need the funding. I did not know where I was going to get my funding from. But I was very bold. I told them I don't want it. And then I just kept praying. I said, God, you wanted me to come to Bible college. My hands are up. You know, when you say hands up, surrender. My hands are up. I don't know, you wanted, you wanted me to come to Bible college, you pay my fees, others I'll have to go back home. And I know God paid all my six years fees that I studied in, yeah, six years I studied in Bible college. He paid my fees, which was almost around to 75K, that was in the 90s, that's quite a lot of money. And I kept praying, I kept praying, and uh, I used to get reminders, your fees is not paid, your fees is not paid, you'll not be allowed to do your final exam. But then I stopped getting those reminders. I knew God just took care of it. Okay. And um, uh, so that is how I studied in Bible college. But when I, when I finished Bible college, I, um, I was praying and asking God where he wanted me to go. And I wanted to do counseling. So I went back to Kolkata where I uh, did my internship for six months. And I wrote a thesis for drug addiction and alcoholism. I was working with drug addicts and alcoholics. And I was praying and I wanted to go back and do counseling. But God was always opening my doors for children's ministry. Whether I was in, in Bible college, he was opening doors for children's ministry. Even when I went to do internship in Kolkata to counsel drug addicts and alcoholics, I stayed with children they picked up from Howrah platform. I was with uh, doing ministry with rack picker children and also teaching in a school uh, scripture for underprivileged children. But I did not understand that God is opening doors for children's ministry, right? So when I... Um, 
when I, when I went back to the same organization, they told me that after Bible college, you can come back and you can start a women's de-addiction center. And I was excited. But then my boss looked at me and said, you're very tired, Selena. Go back home, take rest, and come back after three months. And I didn't go back after three months because I knew that it was not God's will for me to do counseling. And God opened the doors for me to do children's ministry. Then I was doing children's ministry. And... Um, I went to this uh, organization where I received an opening and I knew that God was taking me there. But the first, I think the first six months of first year, it was a, it was a family ministry and I was doing office related work. I was doing everything from accounts to organizing programs to everything. And I didn't realize why I was doing office related work. But after a couple of months, the, you know, the, the, uh, the, boss looked at me and my boss looked at me and said, hey, you're very good with children's ministry. Why don't you start a children's a program for children's ministry? That's how I started a program for children's ministry, wrote the curriculum and started it in schools in uh, Bangalore. But before that, I was doing, you know, uh, hosting programs for this family ministry. And also I was dealing with accounts and library and everything. But everything, I, when I look back, I saw how God trained me in those areas. Uh, because now when you're leading a project, when you're doing all of these things are so important, organizing programs, accounts, you know, managing uh, people, managing the office and everything is so important. So God takes you through those things. But um, uh, if you don't see any breakthrough, if you don't see anything that is happening, then you need to ask yourself if you are in the right place, the right time, doing the right thing. If you're not in the right place, right time and doing the right thing, you will be disappointed. But if you are in the right place, the right time, good doing what God wants you to do, then God, even if man tries to shut those, uh, God will open doors where you can do ministry. So I hope that helps Saubhagya. So we'll move on. Um, we're saying that we can know God's will, but to know God's will, we need to have a, a renewed mind because a renewed mind is only a mind that is able to test the good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. And what is a renewed mind? Yes, a, a renewed mind is a mind that is taking on the thoughts and the ways of God. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 to 11. Now, when people read this um, uh, this verse in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, they say that, you know, there are uh, three kind of God's will. God's will can be either good, can be either acceptable, or can be either perfect. What do you think? Is that right? No, it's actually here talking about the adjectives of God's will, that God's will at any given time is good, acceptable, and perfect. Okay. So it's not pointing or it's not saying like some preachers saying that, you know, um, uh, it is, um, you know, it is something that you need to three categories of God's will. It's not three categories of God's will, but that, that is how some preachers preach it, which is not right. But here it's basically saying that God's will for your life at any given point of time is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, if you look at these words in the Greek, the word good means what is excellent, what is honorable, and what is upright. So God's will for your life is excellent, upright, and honorable. What is acceptable? The, the word acceptable in Greek is what is fully agreeable with God. That means what God agrees for your life is his will for your life life. And the word perfect in Greek means without flaw, without any mistakes, without any errors, without any, um, uh, yes, defects, any failings, without any faults. It is perfect. Okay. So if you have a renewed mind, you will be able to test, analyze, prove, and discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for your life. Now, um, we know that God has a will for our life. We need a renewed mind, but how do we get there? Okay, look at what Ephesians chapter 5 verse 10 says. Can somebody read that, please? Bottom of page number 11. Finding out what is 
acceptable to the Lord. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Now the word finding out here is the same Greek word that is used in Romans chapter 12 verse 2 for proof. Proof test what is acceptable to the Lord. It's the same Greek word. So you and I as believers, it's our responsibility to prove, test, to find out what is the acceptable, perfect will of God. And for that, what do we have to do? Look at what Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14 tells us. It tells us how that happens. Can somebody read Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, please? But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Amen. Okay. Um, so it says that solid food, what is the solid food here talking about? The word of God. Okay. The word of God belongs to whom? Those who are full age. What is the meaning of full age? Mature. Yes, you can be grown up, but you can still be mature. You know, it says those who are, uh, you know, full age mean those who are mature. And when do you come to this level of maturity? Who can be mature? Who is able to discern what is good and uh, evil. Yes. How do you discern what is good and evil? By constantly using the word of God. That is the solid food. So when you are, how are you a mature person? You are a mature person when you come to that place, when you are constantly using the word of God, when you're constantly training your senses to discern what is good and evil, how do you discern good and evil? By knowing what the word of God says. Okay. So how can you be a mature person? You can be a mature person when your senses. What is your senses? How many senses do you have? Five. Yes. What are the five senses? Seeing, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. Okay. So hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, and taste. Those are your five senses. Okay. So how can your five senses be trained? How can you be mature in knowing what is good and evil? By constantly using the word of God. Okay. When you're constantly using the word of God, you have your senses trained or your senses are exercised to discern both good and evil. That means you would you are somebody who's grounded in God's word. You are rooted in God's word, right? The word of God says, "Blessed is a man who's you know who's you know uh, he he's like a tree that is plant meditates on thank you meditates on God's word, you know day and night he meditates on God's word and he's like a tree that's planted by streams of water. Why? Because when you're planted by streams of water, root goes right down into the water, you're getting that nourishment. That means your foundation is strong. So how can you be a mature person? How can you be solid and mature in the word of God? Is when you're grounded, you are rooted in God's word. You're constantly training your senses to use God's word. For example, if you're going through a situation, you have to make a decision between right and wrong. You know, you don't have to go and ask, is it okay for me to lie? Can I tell this lie? It's okay for me to cheat or rob or, you know, look at some things. That, you know, you know, in your senses, your senses are always also trained what God's word says regarding this matter. Okay. So uh, you need to be constantly using God's word. How can you constantly be using God's word? When you're reading God's word, when you're meditating on God's word, not just reading God's word, for the sake of reading it as a ritual. But when you're reading God's word, you're meditating on it. What does it mean of meditation? Huh? Pondering on it, yes. You know, it's that the typical example given for meditating is like a cow. What does a cow do? 
yeah it it swallows all the food and then it brings it back and it keeps chewing on it so you can always see the cow doing you know always doing that why because it's chewing on the food that it is swallowed it's breaking it up into uh, you know better thing for digestion okay so that is what we do for meditating when you read god's word you just don't say hallelujah i finished my uh, meditation for today i finished reading god's word one ritual done but you are constantly thinking about what you read in god's word thinking about it pondering about it okay so you constantly speaking god's word meditating on god's word you are um, you are applying god's word you are living by god's word and you're using god's word and that is when you have your senses trained to know what is good and evil okay so at any point of time in your life when you go through situations you know you are very sure you go back to god's word and god's word says hey this is what you need to do okay and then you'll be able to understand what is good acceptable and the perfect will of god because you are having your senses trained in god's word you are rooted in god's word you are firmly founded in god's word now let's look at some examples okay something very interesting here is all of you are young people i think only a few of you are married okay uh, the rest of you are very young so marriage is on the minds of everybody now you can't say okay i just finished 10th grade okay should i get married let me go back to god's word and see if god's word tells me that i can get married now you can't use why god's word what does god words what what does god's word say you doesn't have to say whether you should get married in, when you're the 10th standard right you also understand times and seasons you know this is not the season for you to get married right you don't have a job you you're not mature you're not able to take care of your own selves then you know how will you take care of someone else you have this responsibility but when you come to an age of 23 24 22 you want to get married then you ask this question should i get married or not so what does word of god say what does the word of god say yes or no does the word of god say anything about marriage should we get married yes genesis chapter 2 was 24 can somebody read that please therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh yes so it's god's will for every man and woman to be married unless god tells you specifically that hey i don't want you to be married i want you to live the rest of your life single okay but uh, unless god specifically tells you thou shall not be married or thou shall not marry okay so other than that it's safe to assume all of us that you know it's okay when we say that you know yes i want to get married and it's a good thing because god wants us to get married and we you know we need to look for somebody to get married okay so now you uh, whose mobile is that whose mobile is that yours can you please put on silent please it will help okay thank you okay so um we see that you know okay you're the age to get married and uh, you see this young beautiful girl or this handsome man and uh, you're very excited and you see there's no ring on their finger so you are even more excited that hey this person is not married and then you start praying okay and um, all the scripture verses that you are reading on you're reading on love whatever you're reading it shows about love and you say hey god is speaking to me okay it's uh, for me time for me to get married because all the scripture verses is love even the bible reading is about love what pastor is preaching the sermons in the church is also about love and then when you're praying deep in your heart there's a stirring and it just says yes this is the person for you go ahead and you're so super excited and uh, maybe in your dreams you're all seeing your that person with you anywhere everywhere and you're very excited and then you're saying yes this is confirmation because it's um, god's word all is about love pastor is preaching about love when i'm sleeping and all the dreams god is speaking to me through dreams also my dreams only i'm seeing this person okay and um, so you're excited 
and then you slowly you know send one uh, message or one uh, chit and you say you know are you whatever you propose and that person says very excited and the person says yes and then all the more excited yes this is god's will because she said yes and so now you have to go to your pastor okay and you have to tell your pastor and you also fast and pray and your fasting and praying is all about you're just thinking about that person and you go to the pastor and the first question your pastor asks you is what is he or she a believer and you're saying oh my god that is the question i didn't want pastor to ask and you're saying i i am so sorry pastor i'm not too sure but you know that girl is very nice very loving uh, you know that guy is very nice he's very loving has a good job treats me very nicely pastor says all that is fine brother or sister but is that person a believer and then pastor opens to somebody can open to second corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 and 15 please open to second corinthians 6 14 and 15 please do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has christ with belial or what part as a believer with an unbeliever amen okay so here it says very clearly you cannot be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever period full stop there's no argument about that so you're very disappointed you said maybe i shouldn't have come to this pastor i should have gone to some other pastor and you know the pastor says i don't know you know um how everything just happened about love and pastor speaking about love you know or you saw in your dreams maybe angel gabriel also would have come and told you i don't know all that that happened but what does the word of god say okay you cannot be married to an unbeliever why because look at what amos chapter 30 or chapter 3 verse 3 says what does amos chapter 3 verse 3 say can two walk together unless they are agreed yes can two walk together unless they are in agreement you cannot walk together when somebody is not in agreement with you so what is god's will for your life to marry yes but to marry a believer yes ma'am my doubt is uh, so before i uh, came to this salvation i doesn't know there are lot of denominations in christianity but after this salvation after i uh i actually born and brought up in roman catholic but after that i came to know this pentecost is there protestants are there lutheran or there many denominations are there but one can especially this roman catholics and protestants and roman catholics are the big denominations right so is it right to marry a roman catholic girl as a believer in pentecost or pentecost boy in roman catholic uh um, because they also believe in jesus but their belief is very you know they believe in saints they believe in mother of mary mother of jesus so they were they are they are different so my doubt is they also believing the scriptures of bible verses of uh, word of god but they also in the category of unbeliever or they will come in yes, believers yes they are in the category of unbeliever actually i i can't uh, elaborate an answer because we go on youtube and you know we are not allowed to talk about other faiths and religions it can be used against us but um, what i would like to say in general is that you know those who only believe the father son and the holy spirit believers those there are many who believe father son and holy spirit or also believe others as well we cannot include them as Uh, under the heading of uh, believers okay and can a believer who is who believes in the father son and the holy spirit be uh, unequally yoked or marry somebody from who is not you know just rooted in or just believing in one god yes you cannot yes but if you have married before coming to the faith then you hold on to your marriage and you stay uh, faithful to that covenant and you pray for your spouse to come in because this happened before you were 
uh, married right does that help yes but what you said the uh, the, the faith that you said that they don't believe they believe that uh, jesus is son but who do they mainly believe you go to jesus through somebody else but we don't believe that you go through jesus through somebody else right another person is not god we just believe god the father god the son god the holy spirit he is the way the truth and life there's no one else that you go and go to the father accepting through the son so anything else the other way is not the truth and we don't associate with that truth and they cannot be called as believers yes um, ma'am i have a question yes Raj yes here. Yes, Iraj. Uh, yeah. Nowadays, actually, I can I have come across uh, the other faith uh, uh, people getting married in the church, uh, but the pastor is asking them to get baptized when they get married before their marriages happens. Uh, is that right or wrong? So, if I can uh, just repeat your question, you're saying the that nowadays the other faith, other faith people, the other believers basically uh if they are uh, getting married to some other person who is uh, from a different congregation uh they sit with the pastor discuss with the pastor and the pastor asks them to get baptized and they baptize and they get married in the same congregation is that right or wrong so you're talking about believers who are from different like from different denominations within the those who believe in in Jesus, yes. but they are from different yes. denominations. Yes. Yes. You're saying that? Yeah, denominations. Yes. So you're saying that suppose um, I'm like now from an independent church, but if I'm getting mm -hmm. to somebody who's married in a CSI church, yes, and he's a believer, yeah, then I CSI go to CSI or church or and I get baptized. And I get baptized. CSI church, any denomination like CSI or you can. Uh, take it as uh, 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 Syrian churches or uh, uh, any churches. Yeah, you can get married to anybody from any denomination, but you know they can just be Christians by name. But what we're talking here is believers means born again. If you are a born again believer, you have to marry somebody who is a born again believer. But if yeah, you... Right. Um, the question is there. Why do hmm. the pastors compel the people to get baptized again when they get into the congregation before marriage? That is a question. I don't think that is uh, it's that I don't think that is necessary. I think that is just a man-made. It, it is happening. I have come yeah, I across. Think, yeah. I think that I have it come is, across. That's what I'm putting it across. So that is it right or wrong? So maybe the pastor is baptizing that person because that person is not already water baptized. So that no, may baptized. be the reason. He's baptized. So the, I have, I have okay, examples. So you can give me more clarity now. Who this person is coming from? Which background? From which denomination? Sorry. From a CSA background. The girl is from okay. CSA background. The girl is from a CSI background. Is, yeah, the and guy getting married is from. Who? Uh, a Syrian background. A Syrian background, okay. Yeah. So, so when she comes, they're asking him to get baptized. Yeah. Getting they, her they got get baptized, baptized and got married also. And she was already baptized when she was in the CSI? Yes. She was taking care of the kids' ministry. She was taking care of what? Kids' ministry. Children's ministry, okay. Syrians yeah. have a different way of baptizing. Yeah, I think this uh, it's a different uh, baptism that the Syrian Orthodox Church is an Orthodox Church, right? It's called a Syrian Orthodox Church. So they have a different uh, baptism, right? For even in people and all people's church, you know, some of us who have a child baptism, where we are not fully immersed, we are just sprinkle baptism. But when uh, the person accepts the Lord Jesus Christ, they want to be baptized again. They take a water baptism, which is you know fully uh, immersing and baptizing uh, that person. We do that at All People's Church. But uh, excuse me, well, if you can all please uh, listen, it'll help. This Thank happens you. in Hearty Churches, actually. Sorry. Child. Child baptism happens in Archie churches. 
Yes, in the CSI and Methodist and all is child baptism. So in the Syrian Orthodox, yes, what yeah, kind yeah, of baptism? She has fully, fully immersed baptism. She has taken fully immersed baptism and she was in the singing squad. For then she moved up to the uh, children's ministry. When she was about to get married, she again she has to get baptized uh, and uh, she got married. Okay, the Syrian uh, baptism is how? Is it sprinkling baptism or water baptism? It's a sprinkling baptism. Okay, so maybe uh, the Syrian Orthodox Church have their own rules and everything. It's a full and baptism. So Sorry, it's a full baptism. They did it for her. Okay, it's so maybe baptism. the pastor would have said that you know you uh, since you have to get married in the Syrian Orthodox Church, you you have to get baptized again. The person was willing because they have to get married, but it's not necessary. It's not important. Yeah, I don't think it's important and necessary. I think what okay, uh, the baptism is not going to help them in the marriage. It's about, you know, it's about how they live faithful to the covenant of marriage that they are getting into. Yes, I'm not saying that baptism is not significant. It is significant, but it is important to teach the significance rather than just keep it as a ritual. I think that is very important. And I think our churches have to come to that place and will take a long time because it's so much of cultural traditions that they are bound to and uh, traditions of the church that they have to follow. Yes, Sahani, you had your hand up quickly, please. Yeah, I just had a question. I know it's about marriage, but what about friendships? Like if you with um, uh, friends, being friends yeah, with somebody of Catholic Pentecostal. I'm sorry, what did you say? Yeah, friendship is totally fine to have friends. Uh, you know, Jesus, when he walked on the earth, most of his friends were all sinners. He related to sinners. And it's important for us to relate to people um, who are also from other faiths so that we can set the, an example. We can be a light in the darkness. We can lead them to Jesus in the way that we live. But we are here specifically talking about marriage. Okay, does that help? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so another example from the Bible and how we can look at God's word. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, for example, divorce. Okay, now imagine, I'll come back to you. Uh, imagine, you know, um, this brother or this, or this sister, for example, Susie. Anyone's called Susie here? Okay. Susie is, uh, you know, suddenly just... Um, um, Thirsting, hungering, and thirsting for God's word. She's married to this lovely man. He's a nice gentleman, takes care of her, very hardworking. And Susie goes to church, but, uh, you know, goes for all the prayer, uh, fellowships, fasting, prayer, Bible study. Her husband has no time for that. He attends church on Sundays. And then Susie, you know, is growing in God's word. She's hungering and thirsting, but she doesn't see her husband coming alongside with her. He does his prayer, he's son on Sunday's church, but he has no time for worship, for fasting and prayer and Bible study because he's busy with his work. So when uh, Susie is attending a conference, she sees this worship leader and she's so attracted to this man. And she's so excited when she sees that he has no ring finger on his ring, uh, ring on his finger. Okay. And she's very excited. And then she's praying and, you know, and she's fasting. And all the time this man is coming before her face and she's hearing a voice that's saying this is the right man for your life the man you are married to is actually was an accident so she's praying about it she's fasting she's quite excited anytime she's closing her eyes anything time she's praying only she's seeing this man so she wants to go to her pastor and tell her pastor that she can do better ministry and uh, her hunger and thirst for God is growing and it can grow even more and can be satisfied because if she joins with this man who is a worship leader, who is a prayerful man compared to her husband. So she goes to the pastor and then the pastor, what does he say? Susie, I don't know whose voice you're hearing. You know, I don't know who's putting those pictures in your mind. But look at what Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says. Can somebody read Malachi chapter 2 verse 16, please? What does Malachi chapter 2 verse 16 says? For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed of your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. So what is it saying here, God? 
hates divorce. And Susie is very sad. So the pastor asks her, Susie, did your husband commit adultery? And Susie says, I wish he did, but he's never done it. He's very faithful. That's the problem. He's a very good man. And then the pastor asks her, has your husband ever left you, Susie? She says, that's another problem, pastor. He never leaves me. I really, you know, see that he loves me and cares for me. And then the pastor says, Susie, you cannot go in for a divorce because this is what the word of God says. The word of God says, unless a man is, you know, caught in sexual immorality or is in sexual immorality, there's no more basis for divorce. So that is God's word. So God's word is very clear and leads us in various areas of his, our lives. And God's word does not contradict. Yes. Yes. Quickly, please. Like these days are like in Bible, it's like little uh, sexual immoral, immor immorality. Immoralities. So in these, in these days, there are domestic violence mm -hmm. and there are other issues like family issues also happens mm -hmm. like in joint families there are things happens so in that case what what like can we do the divorce or not can a woman divorce a guy or not oh uh, yes then it comes to a place where if there is uh... like it's, the issue is not the husband hmm. sometimes it's the husband but there are other people in the uh, family, family then I think the uh, the people in, it should intervene and separate the husband and wife. They should leave together because the word of God very clearly says that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they become one flesh. So talking about unity and oneness and intimacy, also oneness, but also separation, living separately. So that will save their marriage. But if there is sexual immorality in the sense of uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse to an extent where the wife is beaten up or the man is being beaten up, then yes, then there is a, a separation that is, you know, considered for some time. They go for counseling and the the, the church, uh, the, the pastoral team looks and how they can reconcile things and bring them together. But what if that uh, doesn't get like good? It's it's getting worse and worse. It's getting so, worse yeah. and worse. Then the person's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, person's life is at stake. Then yes, there is separation that is required. So in that case, a woman can't divorce? Yeah, in some cases... It has happened where, um, you know, they have gone in for a legal separation, for a divorce, because there has been a lot of abuse and a lot of threat and the woman's life is at threat and her uh, life is at stake. Yes, then there is this calls for separation. The man is, is, is absolutely of no use and it's uh, detrimental to that woman. In such cases, yes, but it depends case to case. Yeah. Ma'am, here you said that two reasons are there for the divorce. That is adultery and uh, I can't remember that. Oh, the one. man leaves you and goes. Uh, separation. Ah, separ but I think in one of the gospel it is written, the Parsis come and ask Jesus, uh, divorce was given by Moses. Hmm. So he says it's because of your hardness of heart. Hmm. So even if a person has committed extramarital affair, hmm. if the other person wants to forgive, then that there is no ground for divorce. Yes, there has been many cases when there has been uh, uh, adultery in marriage and the man or the woman has forgiven each other and they have reconciled and they've continued to live and they've got, not gone in for a divorce. So the church doesn't immediately go for divorce. They bring them for counseling, see how they can help them. And then, you know, uh, that's why I'm saying it differs from case to case. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Sri Raj, you have your hand up. Yeah, the question is that uh, 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 see regarding this divorce, uh, if a person left without any intimation and uh, keeps threatening in mails. Sorry, I'm not able to divorce. hear you clearly. You are uh, getting cut, please. If uh, the person, uh, the, yes. Uh, if I take it as an husband wife, okay, the wife leaves and uh, no, your, uh, uh, your voice is getting cut, so we are not able to hear you. Your voice is getting cut, so I'm not able to hear you. Yes, Shahani, you had a question. 
Yeah, well, part of it was answered. That was my question about in terms of domestic violence, in terms of the man or woman. But what if um, one of the, the husband or the wife or, is abusing the child, the child or stepchild, um, doing physical abuse, being beating the child or the stepchild or sexual abuse of that? Can you divorce? Is that wrong to divorce if it's not with the spouse, but with the child or the stepchild? Uh, Shahani, I am not able to understand you. Uh, it can be your accent, and also you're getting cut. So if, I would appreciate it if you can please post it in the chat section, both you and Sri Raj, and I'll help you with your question. Okay. Okay, we'll just move on till they post their uh, questions on the chat section. So there are various things that we go to God's word. God's word is. Um, very, very accurate, uh, uh, tells us what we need to do, what we shouldn't do. For example, if some of you are doing business, right, or in a workplace and you're stealing money, you know, through some means, you're getting extra money, you're making extra money under the table, whether it's it's black money or whatever, and you're very excited, you're very happy, and you go to pastor and say, pastor, I made so much extra money, and I want to give some of that money as tight. Okay, uh, so what does a pastor say? Does he encourage him and say, hey, he's giving taus, so many lakhs of rupees, so I can take it, it helps the church? No. The, look at what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28 says. Can somebody read that, please? Ephesians 4, 28. Let him, know, let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who is who has need. Yes, so he tells him you should not steal and God will never lead you to commit a sin for a good cause. Amen? So don't say that I lied to save somebody. I lied to save somebody's life. I lied to save somebody's job. I lied to save, lied to save somebody's marriage. A lie is a lie in God's sight, right? We, remember I told you there is no uh, gray, there's only white and black. A lie is a lie for God. So God also will never lead you in the paths of unrighteousness. Okay, If you're walking down the path of unrighteousness, you should know that this is not God leading you. So some people, when we say you should not drink alcohol, it says in the Bible you should not drink wine. They say, hey, this is wine and this is not alcohol. But Paul tells Timothy, you can drink a little wine. Well, that was again the cultural context. Timothy, young Timothy had a stomach issue. And so in those days, they had not much of medicines. So he says you can drink a little wine for his stomach issue. But that does not mean that we all can drink wine. And some people say, hey, the Bible says you can drink wine. There's no where it says you can't drink, you cannot drink or you cannot smoke. Okay. But the word of God is very clear. It says you cannot get you know, addicted to things that can make you an addict, can make you, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. You are allowed to do everything, but everything is not going to help you. Okay. So there is no specific chapter and verse where these things are given, but the Bible basically tells us that we cannot indulge in all of these things okay so god will never lead us in paths of unrighteousness so when you're walking down paths of unrighteousness you should know that he's not leading you and he's not going before you okay so the basis for knowing god's will in any given season any point of your life even if you receive a prophecy from somebody even if you receive a hear a voice even if you see a dream and vision you need to go back to god's word god's word is the basis and the foundation and god will not lead you and ask you to do anything that is contrary to his word okay siraj and sahani we are still waiting for your question Did you post it? Okay, there are some questions here. What about you? What about when you're married in deceitful way and unknown to you? 
um, in a deceitful way when you are married, I think if you are a believer, even if you are an unbeliever, and that's not the right person, God would show. He would bring hindrances. He would stop you. He will show you. But sometimes we are, you know, they say love is blind. Marriage is an eye opener. We are so blind in love, we are able to overlook things. And so we can get deceited, in, uh, we can get uh, into a deceitful marriage. Um, but, you know, God does speak, He does show you. And we need to be very cognizant of those signs and those things that He's showing you. But uh, even if you are married in a deceitful way and you're very innocent, you did not know about it, you know, you can, uh, God can still change things around for you. He can still uh, bring about his plans and purposes in that marriage. He can turn things around. All you need to do is just pray and seek and ask God and press in and you will see a breakthrough. So Sahani's question is, what if the husband or wife is abusing the child or the stepchild if that cause to divorce the spouse or if that calls to divorce the spouse can you divorce um i think yes if it's a sexual abuse if it is um, physical abuse also whether it's your child or a stepchild then you need to take the necessary action yes you need to take the necessary legal action and maybe get the person uh you know go through some uh huh you get the person to for some counseling and some help that is needed and, uh, you know, uh, see how things improve. Yes. Okay. Sri Raj will post in the next session. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for um, the class. And uh, I'll meet you next week. I think we need to really progress. Otherwise, I'm not going to finish the three textbooks. Okay. Thank you.